Now let's talk a little bit about school days. We had what, we, what was known at that time, a parochial school named St. Joseph's Academy. Uh, there were eight grades of classes in the school building. It was a wooden structure, and it was only a block and a half from my home. Uh, it was staffed by the Sisters of St. Joseph of Concordia, Kansas, of which organization I now have a relative, an aunt, Sister Liberetta Pellerin, who has been in the convent now for 48 years and doing very nicely. She is a very well-educated person. She has a bachelor's degree and two masters in theology and divinity and uh, does counseling work at the present time. But getting back to the school, uh, I was in the first grade and uh, we were allowed home for lunch. They had no lunch room in those days. Everybody returned home whether you lived a block or a mile from the, from the school building. And one of the outstanding things that I remember about the school, and I don't know how we ever got along without it, it never had a bathroom. There was only one bathroom and that was for the seventh and eighth graders. And we small children, uh, we went down the basement as best I can remember and the, the, the building was supported by a large number of wood posts in the basement. And uh, they did have one urinal trough down there, but no means of, uh, of having a uh, bowel movement or anything like that. So I really don't know how kids got along in those days. But uh, we went through the school year and uh, I graduated into second grade and into third and fourth. Now the fifth grade was the grade that I found to be very difficult. The fifth grade and the seventh. We had a sister Tekla who taught fifth grade and she was a disciplinarian, believe me. And uh, I went through, of course, the first communion and the confirmation class. The confirmation class, I can remember how we had our religious instruction every day, and then on Saturday as we approached confirmation date, uh, we would gather at the school building, and uh, the girls in one group and the men in, or the boys in another, and uh, we would receive instruction, and when we got a little restless, uh, the uh, nuns that were teaching the classes would have us come out on their front lawn, which was about a half acre in size, and uh, we'd be put into some sort of a military type of formation, three or four abreast and so many ranks deep, and we'd walk up and down underneath these shade trees that were on this front lawn, and uh, we didn't have any respite from religion instruction because we were saying the rosary all the while we were walking up and down. And uh, that went on until our into our confirmation, and uh, I... Uh, I went into the ninth grade, which was in public high school, and uh, there was a course there that I remember very well, two courses. One was commercial geography, which was uh, commerce of the world, I guess you might say now, and uh, I was very good at it. Now that's the only subject that I ever got A's in. Uh, I had a shop class and uh, woodworking. And I made an end table, which at the present time here in 1987, my son Charles has that in his home. So uh, that made a pretty good seven year in my school years. Uh, I was out for track. I was a lightweight boy. I weighed about 110 pounds. And it seemed to me that I could run all day long and never get tired. So I was out for track and received credits for that. And... Uh, at the end of my sophomore year, I was in my 16th birthday, and my brother came home one day and he says uh, he knows where he can get me a job. He was driving truck for the Pierce Hardware Company, and he'd go down to the freight depot where Mr. George Sturk was the freight agent, and uh, his boy was going back to school and there was going to be a job opening. It was a six-hour day six days a week for fifty dollars a month. Uh, our economic or financial situation in the family was not healthy 
Uh, Dad, I think at that time, was making maybe $4.35 a day, trying to support a home, four children. My brother was working, and he wasn't making wages over there at the store. So I decided that I was going to leave school. If my dad had made a living and hadn't gone beyond the fifth grade, I made the mistake of saying that it was ten years of education, ten grades of schooling, I could get out and make a living. So I left school in 1926 and went to work for the Duluth South Shore and Atlantic Railroad Company. And my job was to go down into the freight yards every day and check in and the boxcars coming in and check out the boxcars loaded leaving and then do clerical work around the uh, freight depot. And Mr. Sturt was teaching me the uh, key wireless system and whatever bookkeeping there was going on. And uh, I found it very interesting. And uh, I worked there from September through to the following summer. And uh, he laid me off and put his, his son George back in there for the summer vacation. And then the Depression came along. And I never did get my job back. Railroad and like everything else during the Great Depression years of 1927, 28, and 30, they, everything went down. And uh, he never had any need or any business enough to warrant another person, so I was left without a job. And uh, during those years, why uh, I was 17, going on 18, I did a lot of different work, whatever I could get. This Mr. Casabon was the sectant out there at the cemetery, and he and I would dig graves and bury bodies and and do just about everything. And then uh, he was a handyman for the Bush Brewing Company who owned a lot of property, and they had, back in the days when, when uh, beer and liquor were allowed before Prohibition had come in, the Bush Brewing Company would set people up in business in saloons. And uh, so he owned a lot of property, and Mr. Casabon and I would make a dollar or two uh, going around and uh, doing plumbing repair and whatever else was needed, Mr. Casabon being the handyman and I carrying the box of tools around and doing his legwork for him. And uh, we got along that way for a period of time. Uh, I had... Uh, also an opportunity to work one summer when they were installing gas pipelines. They were going to service our community with, uh, with gas. And uh, my sister Irene was the uh, girl working in the office accepting applications from homeowners for gas service. And uh, I went out on the construction site and I got a job out there digging ditches and burying pipelines. Uh, I don't remember how much I made at that time, but I think it was somewhere around, I would say, 30 cents an hour, 10 hour a day, I would get $3 a day for that. But that was only a summertime job. And uh, I, during the winter months, I didn't do much more than just pick up a few dollars here and there. And Mr. Tupe, he owned the Millview Inn. And, uh, Jerry Michaud was a bartender there, and uh, Al Shank worked there. And I got in working, uh, waiting on tables on Friday nights and Saturdays. And then uh, when these men, either the proprietor or Jerry or Al, would have a night off, they were all good bowlers. And Mr. Tupamp was a, in a cribbage uh, league of some kind. Why, well, I got myself a job back at the bar, and uh, I would get two dollars a night if I waited on tables and if I worked behind the bar I was paid three dollars a night and uh, that was another source of income during the depression years. Well, I became interested in uh, forestry and conservation and uh, I'd go to the public library, our librarian in those days was a lady named Laura Prince and I would get all the books that I that the library had available for loan and I start reading up on on forestry and oh about trees and conservation work and everything like that and uh, I was studying how to 
be a, a, a fire warden, be a lookout man up in the fire tower, and uh, the idea that someday I might work for the Michigan State of Michigan Conservation Department. I was waiting for an opportunity when they would uh, accept job applicants. Well, along came the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was a federally funded program initiated by President Roosevelt to get the young people occupied and working and getting them off the street. I enlisted in that. Uh, we were paid uh, $30 a month. We lived out in the woods in camps. Uh, $25 of that money was sent home to your family and you retained $5 each payday. We lined up and received $5 and that was our spending money for the month. And uh, with my knowledge of uh, having read books on, on forestry and conservation and so forth, I, I had a pretty good deal going, and uh, I got several good jobs out of it. Uh, one that I really liked because I was outdoors, I was on a survey crew, and uh, we would go out and survey the location of fire trails. We were the first ones out there. We would have two chain men and a uh, surveyor. This surveyor happened to be a local man near the headquarters of, of this Forest Service thing, and uh, it was in Kenton, Michigan, which was about 90 miles from home, and uh, Clem Nordeen was the man's name. Uh, he found out that at the ranger station they needed a warehouse foreman because they had some 1,400 Civilian Conservation Corps young men in the woods. They all required tools and equipment, and uh, they needed a full-time warehouse man. And uh, with his recommendation, I got the job. And uh, we had in the neighborhood of five or six tractors, 17 or 18 trucks, and all the hand tools and mechanized equipment that we needed to fight forest fires. And I did that for 15 months. Kind of got me uh, off the street for sure gave me another vast knowledge of uh, the workings uh, as a uh, conservation uh, and uh, woodsman. And uh, I uh, had the opportunity then by inquiring around about the state needing a, a, uh, a people in the uh, fire prevention section. And I made application there. I recall how I did it. I, I got on a train from the, boy, from the civilian conservation camp at 11.30 at night with a candy bar in my pocket for breakfast the following morning. The temperature was near zero. It was winter months. I rode this train from Kenton over into Leonce, got off uh, maybe 4 o'clock in the morning or something like that. Everything is closed up tight. So the only thing that I could do was to go down to the jail. I went down there and knocked on the door and got admission into the building and I spent the uh, next three or four hours or so there until such time as this uh, class, uh, this contest or examination was going to take place at the conservation department. And I took that exam and passed with a very good score. They never did tell me the score but they told me that I was one of the two top people that passed the examination, but they were sorry the other man was a married man with family and uh, he was getting the job. So uh, that was my one time and the closest I ever got to working for the conservation department.